Welcome back to Following Noadon, a Stormlight podcast. This week, we are going through episode 11, which is chapters 36 through 39 of The Way of Kings. We also have Andrew with us this week. Um, I'm Andrew. I like this a lot. You're in sweet. <laughs> You're in good company. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Elliot and Paul, can I get two words from each of you for this this episode? So my two words for this episode, I took my two words and kind of smushed them together into one thought. I'm saying childish expectations. Ooh, I think this is the first time we've had kind of the two words being like one thing. We usually have two words as one word. Like I forgot what our example was, but yeah. Uh, this week... I'm actually going to have Andrew tackle my two words to just since, you know, it's his first episode. We'll see if he has <laughs> two words for this episode. I do have two words for you. Um, my two words would be dichotomy and contrast. Dichotomy and contrast. Two big words. Elliot, what were your two words again? Childish expectations. Childish expectations. All right, let's discuss these. All right, Andrew, would you like to explore your two words a bit further for us? Um, sure. I chose dichotomy and contrast because most of the character arcs um, through these chapters were um, kind of split between um, having um, uh, like a black and white, if you will. Childish expectations. I, I keyed in on kind of a theme I thought I saw in both the Shalon chapters and in the, the flashback Kaladin chapter where we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. I might, I might read a quote for us in a little bit, but essentially I felt like both storylines were, were exploring the idea of when you're a child, you have these very ideal expectations and you, you think that there's simple answers out there for everything and you expect there to be a simple answer for everything. But when you, when you grow up, when you become an adult, you realize that things are a lot more complicated than you thought they were as a child. And young Kaladin and young Shallan are exploring that concept in these chapters. Cool, cool. All right. Before we go any further, I'd like to do a spell check. Elliot, can you say the name of the library in Carbranth for me? I feel like you're taking it easy on me this week because I think this is a word we've we've used on the podcast before. But as long as I'm looking at the right word, this this place is called the Palineum. Good, good. That's how they say it in the book. Paul, can you can you spell it for me? Yeah, this is going to be a walk in the park. I agree, Elliot. Uh, no way, <laughs> no way. This is going to be an error. Uh, I'm going to go with. P A L A E N E U M. Actually, yeah, okay. It's I know it's wrong, but is that your okay, final I, I think answer? E A L I N E U M. Palinium, almost, but. All right, you're close to the second time. You're missing an A and an E. So I was right about the EUM. That was my ambitious move. So I'll <laughs> I'll chalk that up as a win. So glad to see me and Elliot nailed it this week. So spot on. <laughs> Perfect. Spot on. All right, let's dive on into these chapters. Paul, I assume you're happy. We got some action in a Shalon chapter for once. <laughs> I'm happy. Um, yeah, it's about time. We're 36 chapters in. Finally, <laughs> some action in a Shalon chapter. You know, I mean, I'm happy, but at this point, I'm about over it. So, 
it, it happens in such a Shalon esque fashion, though it has to be a lesson. Right. The title of the chapter yeah. is The Lesson. <laughs> Very fitting. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I guess it is fitting. So. That that action sequence caught me a bit by surprise. I I guess I it should have been obvious that using a soul caster on a on a person is a possibility, but for some reason that just hadn't even entered my mind. And so when she whipped out that soul caster and took down those those thugs, I, I was kind of surprised. Was like, whoa, didn't know that was coming. Yeah, when Yasna whips out her soul caster stormlight lasers from, from her yeah. hands. Yeah, she didn't even seem to bat an eye. I I wonder if there's no. maybe even like a history in that she's not her first first time around the block. At the uh, at the end of this, Shalon seems a bit overwhelmed. She's probably just a little shaken up, you know. Not, not nothing. <laughs> I was a little shaken big. up. You're just out for an evening stroll. I mean, not that crazy. And she goes and processes it by diving into books for two weeks. <laughs> Although she handles it all things considered surprisingly well. So considering yeah, if I was a uh, that is how I'd process it. If I uh, was um from from her her background and her situation, that's how I would have I would have processed it and dealt with it as well. I mean, if I was Shalon, I'd be like, finally, something's happening in my storyline. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Like, about time. So I would probably go home and celebrate. I'd be like, all right, it was a good, exciting day. People are going to get more invested in my storyline now. So <laughs> <laughs> I did think it was really interesting how I, I, I've been wondering about that for a while with Shalon, right? So she she's there to steal the soul caster. And we kind of get this sentiment that she's not able to out of a respect for Yasna in a way and uh, kind of really loving the, the worship she's had and the experiences that she's had. Uh, she starts to really doubt that she can go through with her plan. Uh, and we do see that this laser beam... <laughs> incident really kind of pushes her over the edge and she gets so mad at Yasa that she has no more remorse um or she she doesn't feel bad about what she's planning to do anymore so she does steal the soul, soul caster and that's kind of the moment i've been waiting for for ever since we knew about it but i i was really curious to see where that would go it's interesting to note that her final motivation to steal isn't to help her family but it's to spite Yasna because she doesn't feel that she deserves the Soulcaster after what she's done. Yes, and in typical Shalon fashion, where in the back of my mind, I've foreseen this event as she steals Soulcaster and then runs away at night or something. And in typical Shalon fashion, she's like, well, let's wait two weeks. Or something like, let's just let's just relax. Let's uh, slow this down. But, uh, but it definitely was a very exciting Shalon chapter, and so I I really was on the edge of my seat listening to it, which is saying a lot. So I guess we forgot to do this to open. But Andrew, can you tell us how much Stormlight Archive you've read and where you are in the Cosmere? Yeah, I've read um, the first. I've read uh, the Wave Kings twice now, and I've read um, Words of Radiance and Oathbringer once, and then I've read the Mistborn series once as well. Gotcha. On your read through, did you do a physical copy read or listen to it on audiobook? I actually do a hybrid. Um, so I listen to it and I read it. Um, so I feel like my retention uh, is better when I listen to it and read it. Um. Up until this point, uh, Shalon's been used as a uh, her story arc has been used as a way to explain the culture. Um, and like Paul said, this is the first time that anything significant actually happens and it kind of shocks you. You're like, this is out of the normal for her story arc. So it's um, a, a definite shocking moment. And uh, it's I think it's just funny that they did it in a lesson form. Um, 
only with Yasna could you put that that scene in a uh, a lesson hmm. form. Exactly, and then followed by waiting, mm-hmm. and, and and even more fat to uh, Shalon chapter it, fashion. It's so. it's an interesting dichotomy between their two characters because you've got Shalon who comes from her meager background and he she goes back to waiting, but Yasna who's definitely more of action, which. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was funny how we hit a a climax in the the Shalon chapters finally, and then it's immediately back in in thirty nine, back to the kind of slower paced waiting. We mm-hmm. we get a whole section in chapter thirty nine where she's just discussing philosophies and kind of going through all the different types of philosophies that are out there that she's she's researched and whether she agrees with them or or disagrees with them. So it was a brief foray into action and then right back to books. It is an interesting way that she processes and is coming to terms with her changing character. Um, the way that she, she processes things, which is through her, her newfound love of scholarship. And it, it plays into kind of some, a series of hints that we've, that we've gotten so far. She draws a, a death scene or or what we're assuming is like a murder scene and i'm i'm trying to remember if it was explicit or if we're just implying this but my immediate assumption was that that was the death of her father did she say that or am i just implying that do you I, remember i don't know if she said that if it says that or not yeah i don't i don't remember either but i if it didn't imply that my immediate thought was that she had just drawn the the death of her father and if that is true, kind of putting some some things together, we, we've we seen Shalon most of the time when she draws, not all the time, but most of the time she uses her, her memory, capital M memory ability to kind of like take a snapshot of whatever she, she's looking at. So if, if this is her father, I'd be willing to go out on a limb and guess that she was there when when this happened. This isn't just her drawing a description from someone. This was, you know, she was there at the the death of her father and this again kind of plays into my my fears or my theories that there's something darker in her past she if this is if this is all true i think this would imply to me that she was involved in the death of her father somehow either she was there or maybe she did it i mean that that's a pretty wild theory i think at this point but you know was she involved at some point i'm starting to lean more and more towards yes you're very good at these forecasts. <laughs> he sounds I... a lot like Shalon if we're putting that out there. Study mm-hmm. it, research it, make a prediction. Fair <laughs> enough. Resident Shalon. Yes. I'll take that title. Yeah, wrong hair color, but my beard's probably better than hers. I don't know. Well, we don't know yet. My my words for this episode were were childish expectations and that idea was was founded on a, a quote here from from Yasna that I want to go ahead and read. So Shalon and, and Yasna are, are are talking about you know philosophy and, and whatever else. And and Yasna says this when we are young, we want simple answers. There is no greater indication of youth, perhaps, than the desire for everything to be as it should, as it has ever been. The older we grow, the more we question. We begin to ask why, and yet, we still want the answers to be simple. We assume that the people around us, adults, leaders, will have those answers. Whatever they give often satisfies us. And they go on and talk a little bit more. I don't want to don't want to read the whole thing, but essentially the concept being when we're when we're young. When we're a child, we we see a problem in front of us, and we assume that there's a a one sentence explanation for that, and we want to find out what that is, and that's why kids ask questions all the time. You know, why, Dad? Why? As a as a new parent, this is coming soon. As my my kids are learning how to talk, I can see it coming already. But as when we get to adults, we learn that this is that life is way more complicated than we thought it was as a child, and sometimes when the adult pushes off the child as Oh, you'll understand when you're older. No, that's exactly what they mean is you'll understand when you're older because you can't right now. And then all of that from from childhood into adulthood and that maturing of understanding and concepts 
leads really well into the, the upcoming Kaladin chapter where we go back to young Kaladin as he's wrestling with his father Liren's struggle with the the Bright Lord Rashon, and he's looking for a simple answer, and Liren kind of shows him it's it's a lot more complicated than that. Hmm. Yeah, I always like the the throwback Kaladin chapters, and here we, we learn about Rashon, who is the new like Lord Wistia, right? Um uh since his passing. And we definitely see a much different dynamic than the previous relationship between Kaladin's family and Lord Wistio. Um, now there seems to be a lot of unresolved, maybe. Unresolved. There seems to be a lot of unresolved issues or so, maybe between like Kaladin and Laurel, right? And And this, you know, his kind of childhood crush almost. Um, and we kind of start to see ways that this is things get awkward and maybe even a way to tell that Kaladin's starting to leave this, you know, childish childhood state of mind almost. Something to note here is young Kaladin doesn't have a problem, uh, even reveres light eyes and current 19 year old Kaladin despises light eyes. So maybe that has something to do with La Laurel. Could could definitely be. I think I think Paul, you're onto something here. That this was definitely a maturing moment for for Kaladin, a, a slightly painful one. And that he there's this girl that he was interested in and thought was her fr- was his friend. Turns out she is fully embracing the the new light eyes and is ready to kind of kick him to the curb. Mm-hmm. It's definitely a way we can see the. The light eyes kind of starting to tug, tug on his heartstrings, almost or like starting to, to find some way that can really like affect him. Um, yeah. Another, another way that uh, we've seen development through these flashback Kaladin chapters is going back briefly to Tian. Um, I was thinking about this earlier, so we we've talked a little bit about how Kaladin, I guess, like he struggles with depression and he kind of. Isn't always the happiest camper, I guess. Um, well, we we see some examples in this chapter, I believe, of Tian and how he kind of seems to make everything grand and almost sounds optimistic in everything. Um, so even like the littlest puddle, he'll he'll describe as something grand or or majestic. And uh, I think that kind of shows a little more about how much. Kaladin might be missing Tian in the present and how much that could affect him because it might have kind of been a, a counterbalance growing up uh, with kind of his like mood or, or outlook on, on things in life it was kind of a really positive friend, you know, just always optimistic. If you remember back to older chapters when Laurel and Kaladin and Tian were younger, that Laurel noted that Tian's ability to always be able mm-hmm. to cheer Kaladin up and how she's jealous of that almost, of Tian. It's intriguing how you're starting to see the, the contrast starting to, to to deepen and to enrich in these characters as they move forward um, in in the books. And it's it's enriching their characters. Um, the, the contrast between Tian and Kaladin is uh, starting to become more stark and... Um, it's intriguing as you move throughout the book. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when we first learn about it, we we know they're brothers, right, growing up. So we know that they were friends, did stuff together. So you understand that uh, pain that Kaladin has whenever we we find out that uh, Kaladin died, or not Kaladin, uh, Tian dies. Um, you know something I don't know. Ooh. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, but this kind of was something I thought about that that shows a little deeper on that and kind of what Tian might have provided uh, for Kaladin growing up um, and stuff. So, Yeah, we talk about maturing and how, how Kaladin is having some painful experiences that are, are forcing him to mature. I, I think sometimes that's not always a, a good thing. It, it is a good thing in you know coming to adulthood, but at the same time, maturity can also turn into cynicism and I think Tien balances out 
kind of some of the painful world experience that, that Kaladin is starting to get exposed to just with his innocence and his his naivete and just his childlikeness. And it, it's a good influence, I think, on Kaladin at this point, which, yeah, is going to lead to, I think, a pretty heart-crushing moment when he does eventually die because we know that's coming. With Tian and Kaladin's relationship also comes their mother and the conversation they have with her about Spren of Roshar and if there's really Spren in everything. <laughs> Dung Spren. So you guys aren't alone when you don't understand the rules about Spren. Uh, not even Rosharians know everything uh, about Spren. Yeah, I think me and Elliot are Kaladin and Tian in this scenario <laughs> where we're yeah. like, Spren and everything? What? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Pretty of. much. Yeah. It reminds me um a long time ago. I remember here Paul Paul making jokes. Is there uh is there this type of sprint? Is there this type of sprint? And it's as like, as you move along you're like, Oh, yeah. There's there that is. type of sprint. We still <laughs> we still are following to see if Nodon is what a, a intelligence sprint? Is that is that what it was? No, knowledge, knowledge sprint. sprint. Knowledge sprint. Okay. This... <laughs> it's, it's on the same avenue of thought. But yes, I, knowledge I'd sprint. like to claim that this brings back that theory into contention. If everything it has a spread, totally does. then perhaps perhaps knowledge know it on can have a knowledge spread inside him, even though Somewhere. they kind of talk about that's not Somehow. possible. But I'm clinging to it. I'm clinging to it. <laughs> I am as well. I'm still sold. I'm not even <laughs> I'm not even it's not even in my mind that that might be incorrect. <laughs> so. oh, yeah, obviously. Mm -hmm. So without giving any spoilers, what are your insights as to what Spren are, uh, Andrew? Mm. Tricky question. Um, I, I might, I might hearken back to at this point, I might go the more religious route, like, Kaladin's mother and I'd say Spren are in everything and are of everything so it's very hard to allude to that question without giving a lot of spoilers so I know there's After more this... to like about Spren so they're not just little, <laughs> and little bugs as, as we continue around. to move through the books having read all of them I, I, I'm sure Trevor can attest to this like we don't know all about Spren yet so it's a continually evolving uh, relationship between the reader and um, the, the 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 antagonist, the protagonist in the book, and it's continually evolving. So, like many things, we're we're figuring them out one by one. But I I did come out of this chapter now, kind of thinking of Spren as the souls of inanimate objects. So Kaladin's mother Hasina says, "No, you don't have a Spren. You have a soul. But that rock over there, it's got a Spren." So. That's now my comparison for him. The end of chapter 37, we have a reveal that Kaladin needs to come to come to grips with. And uh, that is that Kaladin's father, Liren, did indeed steal the, the gemstones, the spheres, from Wistio, from Wistio's deathbed. Wistio was planning on giving the spheres to uh, Liren, but he wasn't coherent enough to say so in his will. So uh, Liren just takes them when Wistio dies and all of uh, the villagers that claim that he stole them, are they are validated. And so that this, this proposes an awkward question because he doesn't own them but he knows that Wistio intended to give them to him so is that stealing? That was very much like a Shalon type of moral question. <laughs> I'm asking our resident Shalon um, Elliot <laughs> is, that a, is that stealing? I... I feel personally like it is. I I think that I'm I'm in Kaladin's shoes. I'm with with Kaladin where he's pretty shocked to learn that his his father, who he obviously holds very much up on a, a moral pedestal of as a man of very high character, and and to learn that he took these fears in a even slightly devious manner is is a huge shock, and it 
it definitely changes my my not my opinion necessarily, but just my my view of of Liren's character and motivations. He he clearly is a man of virtue and a man of character, but obviously he has a I don't know if you want to call it a flaw, but just an aspect of his character that that a lot of heroes do, and that he's he's willing to compromise some of his his virtues of character for his family, and and this that definitely changes my my view of him. But I think it definitely does go down in the book as as stealing. Now I think there's probably a case to be made that it is not necessarily a, a horrible type of stealing. He he didn't necessarily hurt anyone in, in the doing of it and Wistio probably intended to give them to him anyway. So there there's a case to be made there, but I don't think you can I don't think you can argue it wasn't stealing. Paul, any thoughts? I think yeah, they did a pretty good job explaining it. I can say it definitely looks like stealing. Uh, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of whether or not it technically is stealing or not, um, assuming we know that Wistio did intend to give them, then I would say probably not. But it definitely, like the the people are going to feel, the people who are upset with Lyran are going to feel justified in in that. I, I guess I'm wrestling with the same question that Calderon is wrestling. And that really just comes down to is was Liren brave for what he did, or was he cowardly for what he did? I think I'm in the brave camp, but that's a harder question for me to answer. Okay. Andrew, thoughts? I think it's really interesting how um the author took Liren, who at this point was someone who was very highly looked up towards, and he really humanized him. Mm. Um it changed yes. my entire opinion of Liren from this point on, which in turn actually affected my viewpoint of Kaladin. Um, I don't know if that was brilliant writing tactic or if that was uh, just the way it happened, but um, I, I actually really appreciate the way that he, he did this because it really humanizes a god figure, which is an interesting um, an interesting way that he he. So it's no coincidence that this chapter coincides with Shalon's chapters of trying to figure out what is lawful and what is moral. And yep. Shalon is trying to trying to consider uh Yasna's actions that is like and she she goes through all of these different uh studies of philosophy in chapter 39 and she doesn't con she doesn't confront her till uh next week but she's she's reading all these different types of uh, types of philosophy of what's lawful and what's moral and this is definitely one of those one of those things where it might not be lawful but it may be moral morally good it he can definitely save a lot more lives by keeping the spheres um and so I, I might be actually diametrically opposed to Elliot on this viewpoint where um, I think that it was actually a good thing that he kept the spheres because he can do more good uh, as opposed to uh, as opposed to giving them back and being more moral. Cool. Any closing thoughts on this flashback chapter? The first time that my big takeaway highlights from the entire episode all the chapters we read was the cool shallan chapter oh that's good the first, <laughs> the first time like the kaladin chapters like they were great and there was the you know we find out that Liren took the the spheres and stuff but it wasn't as big to me as something that happened in a Cal uh, a shallan chapter so groundbreaking a new first you know all right uh we let's let's discuss this Kaladin chapter. It's it's a very short chapter and it's more of a Teft chapter actually. Um mm -hmm. Kaladin is kind of uh incoherent on the floor and there's just one one brief part of this chapter that I really wanted to highlight from Kaladin's perspective that Kaladin is like not conscious and when he is conscious he's seeing 
spread. Delirious. Yeah, he's he's seeing spread that you're not supposed to be able to see. So I want I just want to emphasize how dire of situation that Kaladin is in. The Kaladin uh, diagnoses himself as fatal in in his in his surgeon mind. He's going through all of his symptoms that like he just can't help himself that he's been doing in the whole book up until this point. He sees his symptoms. He's seeing that he's delirious, and he knows he will probably he's probably going to die. And then Taff walks in, and that changes. There, there's a moment in there though, while he's delirious, that I thought was epic. In a small way, because it's still she, she's epic in a small way. As he's delirious and seeing these death spren coming to get him, Syl is there defending him. What another cool moment. Just like when she stood in front of him in the high storm, here she is again. I think it even describes her with like a, a glowing sword mm-hmm. fighting off the death, death spren. I was like, ah, so cool. Go, Syl. It also describes her in a different visual sense. She's She's visually more mature than she ever has been she looks older she looks more she looks less translucent i should say she looks more as a as an actual being as opposed to a spren and that could just be kaladin's being kaladin being delirious or that could be something more she always has been and probably always will be the mvp you know (laughs) i mean I, I, I consider Shalon my MVP. But if you wanna, if you wanna settle for Sill, that's fine. Yes, Shalon, with you. <laughs> She's okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's okay only because so as... she has one exciting chapter. <laughs> so as this chapter continues, we do get definitive, undeniable proof that Kaladin is using Stormlight to do supernatural things. Up up until this point, I think we were 99% sure. Here we see it firsthand, or or Teft sees it, should I say, of Teft gives Kaladin or puts these glowing spheres into his hand, and Kaladin subconsciously, he's not even awake at the time, absorbs that Stormlight, and Teft watches the wounds on Kaladin heal as he's doing this. It is... It is, it is finally proven 100% that Kaladin is, is using this Stormlight, and it, it has an interesting effect on Teft that I don't quite know how to process yet. He does go on a mental ramble about uh, Envisagers and uh, Shock and why now, why me? He's very, yeah. in, he's very at all. I think it's an interesting way for them to bring in another character into into this narrative and to give him a little bit more depth. Because uh, until this point, they've, they've just been kind of helping out and they've, they've been flat characters. But now you're like, Tef, Teft has character and depth now. There's stuff we're not seeing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, that'll get expanded on later. But it's very, it's very intriguing that they start now building on for the future. This is a very Brandon Sanderson way to expound upon a mm. character. There, he's Completely. showing you that you're just that you've just seen the tip of the iceberg. You don't know how deep the iceberg goes, but he's just showing you there is a whole depth here. You don't know how big exactly that is, but uh, he he's not taking an entire four paragraphs to talk about Teft. He's just giving you three sentences and. Now you're supposed to think, oh, I don't know everything there is to know about Teft. Yeah, and and if you're not paying attention, you can easily gloss over it. Right, and um, that's yep. totally his Definitely. style, and it is uh, a, it's fantastic. It's it's easy to forget that these bridgemen were made bridgemen for a reason. They all have some kind of horrible something they they've did in their past. Either they've murdered someone or something of that level to get made a bridgeman. And sometimes you, I, at least when I'm reading, kind of forget about that. And then we, we get this moment here where Teft is starting to process his past. And he talks about the envisagers, like you just mentioned, Trevor, I'm really confused as to what they are, but he talks about 
them being dead, which I didn't quite follow the logic there, but it almost implied that they, he did something to to kill the envis- envisagers or they're dead because of him. But it, I don't think we have enough info here for me to process the whole thing. It's going to be all chalked up on the questions for later board. Right. One other thing, um, when I was rereading this, I noted um, Teft goes out of his way to um, give Kaladin something uh, that would um, he would use for himself. Uh, it, it notes that he would it, it would buy a f- the the stormlight that he would he used would buy a few drinks, which might hint that Teft has some bigger problems than we know. But he's actively going out of his way to heal Kaladin with those fears, which. Um, I didn't pick up on the first few times that I've read this passage. That is a good spot. Yeah. I, I remember it mentioning that, or Tef thinking to himself that he's never saved a sphere before. He He's always spent them. So mm-hmm. that, that keys into very much what you're saying there of he's, I don't know, gambling problem, drinking problem, who knows, but saving money is not a, something he usually does. And so you're right. He's totally going out of his way and making a sacrifice here to help Kaladin, which tells you just how far Teft has come in, in the chapters we've read so far. Yeah. All right. Any any closing thoughts on this entire, uh, entire episode, gentlemen? I do have None one here. I do have one thing to leave you guys with. It is a quote from chapter 39. It's from Shalon, and she's talking to herself, kind of. Of course, there was one other aspect of that night that Shalon had to think of. She carried a concealed weapon that she hadn't used. She felt foolish for not even thinking of getting it out that night, but she wasn't accustomed to. Shalon froze. Realizing for the first time that she'd been drawing, not another scene from the hallway, er, not another scene from the alleyway, but a lavish room with a thick ornamental rug and sword and swords on the walls, a long dining table set with a half-eaten meal. Any thoughts on what the concealed weapon is? I remember reading that and scratching my head. So, I mean, to answer your question, no, I wasn't really sure. It, it seemed to imply that she was carrying some sort of a knife or something. But you, you would think you would think she would have thought of that while they're walking through the the dark alley with the the scary men all around. So, yeah. yeah, I don't know. I'm scratching my head on that one. She might have had it, but not been ready to use it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> my lips are sealed. I was going to say, you're not allowed to answer, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, concealed knife. Is that, is that what we're going with? A knife. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got. Cutting edge right there. <laughs> okay. Uh, we can leave it at that. Thank you for joining me, Elliot, Paul, and Andrew. We will see you guys next week. Sayonara. See ya. Bye.